Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so Ali got a sneak peek at some of my unpublished writings. Uh, we used to be a neighbors until recently. Uh, so it's my next boat neighbor. And uh, I gave him some stuff that I was actually not courageous enough to publish yet. And he read it, got excited, told me to give this talk. So I, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, so I'll start by mentioning Walter Benjamin and the theories uh, of Walter Benjamin. And I'm going to use this concept of messianic and repeat it in, uh, in this talk. And let's just start by toning it down using uh, Walter Benjamin. Uh, so Walter Benjamin suggests that we usually live, live life in this homogeneous empty time, right? Just life kind of continues. But once in a while, there's a burst in history, a burst of history, which he calls, which is related to what he calls a weak, a weak messianic uh, force. And that is the revolutionary energy, right? So he's interested in the kind of consciousness in the revolutionary moment in society. And what he says, the consciousness of exploding the, the continuum of history is peculiar to the revolutionary classes in the moment of their action. And what he reveals is that at the moment of the action, the revolutionary bursts, uh, the ones that we kind of look back at history and we see those images, the French Revolution, the hippie revolution, as if we see also like collective traumas of the past, the Holocaust, wars, right? So these almost like peak moments, societal moments that reveal themselves as images in history. Uh, he says that there's a unique consciousness that happens in these moments, and he calls that the weak uh, messianic uh, power. Right? So I'm kind of going to use that. And like uh, Walter Benjamin reveals that there's a spiritual in the political revolutionary moment, I'm going to talk about the, the political within the kind of spiritual moments uh, using similar concepts, using this weak messianic power. And if we think about the kind of mystical union the ego dissolving uh, moment, the moment of like, we you know the archetypical mystical union is the one uh, that maybe Buddha represents in this kind of acceptance uh, beyond good and bad, beyond black and white, beyond identities. Uh, we all dissolve into one universal space uh, beyond history, beyond space and time, right? It's a very uh, compassion to all, love to all. This is the, the classical archetypical mystical union. Uh, in contrast to this, we can see the prophetic, prophetic moments. And they have, uh, this is where what I gave Ali to read, and he kind of like invited based on that kind of few paragraphs. But the, the prophetic moments are uh, moments which are on the uh, stage of history, right? There's maybe even a strong ego at the moment. There's a moral message. There's a revelation that wants to be channeled to a, a revolutionary spirit. Uh, there is uh, good and bad. Uh, there is not just uh, acceptance, there is also resistance in those moments. Uh, it's not just about harmony, but it's also about liberation, right? It's a, it's a, there is an energy of, of act, active energy uh, in those revelatory prophetic moments. Uh, and a lot of scholars, uh, also in Judaism, and I'm kind of reading a few Kabbalistic scholars like uh, Gershon Sholem, who kind of does this differentiation between uh, mystical and messianic, or rather do between mystical and prophetic. Uh, and I want to say that I'm inspired by uh, interviews I did to Israelis and Palestinians in the ayahuasca groups that I uh, studied ethnographically, qualitatively. And like every good transpersonal qualitative research, I was uh, transformed by actually asking questions, by uh, getting close to uh, new things that emerged from the stories that I was told. Uh, and I, I, I realized that the harmony, uh, the oneness I, ideology that kind of exists in that culture that I, I study also served the status quo. It served a political status quo. It served the oppression of Palestinians. It denied uh, collective uh, resistance. It was denied conflict from being in the space, which sometimes is need for the acts of liberation. Uh, but I realized there are other unique events, moments, uh, there are more rare that are revelatory. Uh, for example, the uh, story of Fatima, who drinks ayahuasca, a Palestinian woman drinks ayahuasca. She's double oppressed, right? She's oppressed from Israelis. She's also oppressed from a patri patriarchal, very patriarchal society in a village that she grew up in. And she drinks ayahuasca with uh, 
Israelis mostly in Yom Kippur and have an apocalyptic almost vision, of cycles of war and trauma, of blood of going into the land. Uh, and in that moment, she, she sings the well -known almost, uh, of uh, in the prophetic energy song from she sings the opening paragraph of, of the Quran. And she wants to transmit a message to the rest of the group, a political message. Uh, and that moment ignites her, changes her practice. She starts spreading uh, ayahuasca to more uh, Palestinian people, to women. She wants to activate the women's voice in the ceremonies. And that uh, uh, kind of gives her a mission in life that moment. So I'm going to, uh, uh, actually, before I do that, so going back to the uh, concept of messianic energy, uh, I would like to say there's not, a, I, I started by creating those dichotomies, but now, now I'm going to merge them. Uh, Moshe Ebel, who studied Kabbalah uh, throughout history, and how messianic uh, ideas uh, kind of intersect with different Kabbalistic uh, approaches, right? So he studied the intersection of, uh, he, in a book called uh, Messianic Mystics, so the talk is named of this book, uh, and he realizes that there are few types of messianic uh, forces that they can change, right? But he, he writes, the emergence, the emergence of a messianic consciousness can often be tied to a special inner spiritual occurrences which can provide a person with an awareness of his own special importance that will sometimes express itself in overtly messianic mission. So there's a recognition here that mystical practices can also bring that energy. If the mystical goal is defined as uniting not only with the absolute and unchangeable, uh, but also with the revealed and changeable, right, the relational world, uh, the mystic is part of the becoming godlike, may be incited to act in the temporal and changing world. Uh, so what he argues is that there are two, two types of messianic uh, forces. We can uh, see them on spectrum. There's the messianic persona or the messianic leader, but there might be diffused. It might be a messianic community, a messianic movement, uh, a messianic uh, research group, a messianic uh, ceremony group. Uh, messianic, uh, maybe uh, large, large movement. It can be a messiah of every generation, so not just a one messiah, but a messiah that redeems every small uh, events in generation. So this is the ideas of diffusing messianism, uh, not just to one personality, but to few, right? Uh, but it can be also a process. It can be an event. It can be an experience. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't have to be to the redemption of the whole society. It can be a small redemption. For, uh, for the self, but if they're still revolutionary, they still have those emotions in them. Uh, it doesn't have to be a large social movement. It could be aggregated personal change, what uh, uh, sometimes people uh, say that we need, need to reach a tipping point when there's aggregated, aggregated personal change. But all of these are kind of strategies, and all of these, the, the, the messianic energy is diffused. And I'm going to give a few examples, historical examples of this occurring in uh, psychedelic history. Some of them will be bombastic and big, some are smaller, lighter, uh, and uh, you're gonna, I think, enjoy them because we're gonna start with Allen Ginsberg uh, and uh, his 1960 messianic event. Uh, at the time, uh, Huxley is the main prophet in psychedelia, uh, provides this el elitistic, uh, elitist approach to psychedelia. I suggest that it shouldn't go to the masses, uh, and uh, but every but many people kind of influenced by Huxley. He creates the foundation of psychedelia and still is a part of the foundations of psychedelia, uh, Western psychedelia. And uh, Ginsberg goes to the Amazon few years before and uh, drinks Yahe and William Burroughs. So Ginsberg is a beat poet, a Jewish, gay, uh, kind of complex uh, personality. He actually had at his youth a revelation of uh, William, a spontaneous one, a revelation of William Blake uh, that kind of motivated him in, in his life. And uh, he goes to the Amazon, he drinks Yahe, uh, and William Burroughs goes again, they exchange the Yahe letters, and then they return, uh, they go to visit Timothy Leary, Leary back then is in Harvard, still a professor in a university, didn't really break uh, yet from the university, and uh, Leary was also, it's good to, to know that Leary was a protege of Huxley, so they're, they're closely related, uh, so for example, we all know that when Huxley died, Laura Huxley gave him uh, LSD at his deathbed. That LSD was given uh, by uh, Timothy Leary to Laura Huxley, and Laura Huxley was reading uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead at that moment to, to Huxley. Right, so there's a close relationship, close relationship, and Leary is in a way a Huxleyan, he's a devoted Huxleyan, uh, still containing this elitistic approach. And then Ginsburg comes, he says to Leary, look, this is what they do in the Amazon, 
uh, there's a curandero, there's a ritual. Can you hold a space for us with mushrooms? And Liri holds a space for Ginsberg and a few others. And Ginsberg, uh, and there's the music of Wagner at the moment, very intense uh, Wagner music. And in the moment, uh, uh, Ginsberg has horrible experience, really challenging. He sees apocalyptic visions. He, didn't, he kind of uh, wants to deny his gay, uh, his gay identity, his challenge in that in the moment. And everything is kind of attacking him from all sides. Leary comes and relaxes him. And then it opens up to a, a messianic frenzy, right? So he, he takes the clothes off, runs naked. And, uh, and Ginsberg says on that moment, it seems as if all the world of human consciousness were waiting for a messiah, someone to take the responsibility of being the creative God and seize power over their universe. He runs naked downstairs and says, I'm the messiah. I've come down to preach love to the world. We're going to walk through the streets and teach people to stop hating. We're going down to the city streets to tell the people about peace and love. Right? And he wants, the world, uh, he wants to call world leaders at the moment, the Russian world leaders, uh, the American ones, let's turn everybody on acid. It's kind of like that mentality. Uh, in the end, he calls his friend Jack Kerouac and tells him, uh, Jack, come take, take a plane up here immediately. The revolution is beginning. Gather all the dark angels of light at once. It's time to seize power over the universe and become the next consciousness. Right? <laughs> and that, some things begin there. Leary later on writes on that moment, uh, Alan Ginsberg came to Harvard and shook us loose from our academic fears and strengthened our courage and the faith in the process, right? So something is stirred up. Uh, Leary and, uh, and Ginsburg create this pact of turning on the masses. Uh, they use their uh, art uh, tie, ties to the art world, ties to the academic world, the uh, academic kind of credibility. And in a way, it's not Ginsburg who becomes a messianic figure. It's more Leary that becomes that. Uh, but they create this kind of uh, um, deal at the moment, uh, which influenced society and kind of uh, influenced our, our movement in a way. Uh, it's good to remember it's not happened only there. Ken Kesey also had in the West Coast some of those schisms uh, breaking loose and kind of trying to, to turn more people on. And that thing at the time uh, emerged in few places, so not just then. So let's go a bit back in time and say, uh, tell a story of another important figure. So this is Master Irineo from Santo Daimi, um, around 100 years ago, uh, who has a similar uh, narrative almost in some ways. There is a similar narrative in the Daimi. Uh, Master Irineo is a descendant of African slaves. He lives in the Amazon. He's a rubber taper. It's a politically intense moment in history of the Amazon. Uh, he goes to drink ayahuasca. He connects to the Amazonian tribes. And he goes to drink ayahuasca with a Peruvian caboclo. Uh, in a ritual which was actually aimed for, anyone wants to guess, what was the ritual aimed for? It was aimed for achieving financial success, right? Because uh, there's all our rituals like that as well. Uh, but all he got is graveyard and crosses and uh, intense, challenging moments. But after the experience, he said, okay, there's something cool here. He brewed an ayahuasca himself. He invited his friend to his flat, and they drank ayahuasca together, uh, just two of them. Uh, his friend Antonio, uh, Antonio, uh, Antonio Costa, and in uh, Antonio's vision, a, a lady is visiting, a uh, deity, uh, female deity is visiting and telling him, I have a mission for you, Antonio. And Antonio says, no, please, no, I don't want any mission. Uh, but my friend Irene want, might want this mission. <laughs> <laughs> and Irene drinks again, and the deity comes, and uh, she, she, she tells Irene, I have a mission for you. And uh, he goes for a dieta for eight days, and in the dieta, he gets a lot of uh, uh, kind of meet this deity again and again. Later on, he calls her Queen of the Forest or Virgin Mary. Uh, and uh, what he receives, Ido Hartogdon suggests that he receives uh, the set and setting, a new set and setting for, the, for ayahuasca, right? He changes the name to Daini. He changes the ritual, the ritual to become more communitarian. Uh, he brings new songs. This is the most important part. The deity tells him, you need to sing. And he brings new songs. The songs are not the regular chants from the Amazon. They're hymns. They are uh, uh, sing-alongs. They're anthems in their essence. And this is how they build the doctrine, through songs. And through a few decades, they build the doctrine to songs. He creates a community, a very strong community. But after, eventually, like every strong community that deals with revelatory uh, experiences, schisms wants to emerge, right? It's hard to hold a doctrine in such a community. Uh, there's a lot of re rebels inside, there's lots of gossip, 
to create songs that try to suppress the gossips, uh, the gossip in this the community. Uh, but then he dies in uh, the 60s. Uh, and, uh, uh, and when he dies, he cannot hold it anymore. And few schisms happen in that community. The most important one is uh, Sebastio Mota, Padrino Sebastiao, uh, who broke and kind of from the initial community, the foundation of the Santo Daimi, he broke and created the Santo Daimi into a global movement. Uh, again, a story of revelation, uh, new instructions, new songs that emerge from that moment. And kind of that schism is the force of what led Santo Daimi to become a global movement. So we see already patterns here that, that are similar. I would like to mention also. We go back in history even more to John Wilson uh, for Peyote and the diffusion of Peyote. Uh, Peyote, 140 years ago, is mainly uh, centered in Central America. It starts to diffuse slowly, slowly to, to, to North America. It is politically intense moment. Uh, again, colonization. Again, we see the ghost dance movement emerging in that, which is a millenarian movement movement uh, uh, for indigenous people. Uh, in opposition to their white colonizers, the identity, the pan-Indian identity, the uniting of the tribes is, cre is created uh, in that moment in opposition to white colonizers. Uh, and uh, John, Wilson, John Wilson comes from this, moon, from this moon da uh, ghost dance movement. And Munei, who studied that, one of the first kind of peyote anthropologists, uh, wrote about ghost, ghost dance. The great under, underlying principle of the ghost dance doctrine is the time will come when the whole Indian race, living and dead, will be united upon a regenerated earth to live a life of Aboriginal happiness, forever free from dead disease and misery. Right, and these are the energies that John Wilson uh, joined the Bayore ceremonies with, and, and has a, revel, a revelatory moment. Uh, he becomes a messianic figure. Uh, and he serves his community, but he goes, travels everywhere, and he spreads the message of Peyote. And in a very quick moment, a hype moment in time, uh, we see Peyote spreads uh, throughout North America for indigenous people in the structure of first small Peyote groups, but then later the Native American church. Uh, again, that mo revelation motivated him in the kind of the, the rest of his life. And that movement, it was almost a political movement in some way, uh, created a situation when peyote was a threat to American government, and peyote was the first drug to become illegal uh, by the U.S. government uh, through those political uh, reasons. It's also important to mention that uh, John Wilson became very rich from this. Okay, uh, he had financial incentives, so it's not like uh, they're they're always there. It's, there's always some ambivalency in all those in all those stories. So looking at the stories and we try to find some similarities, right? So we, we, we uh, see this kind of pre-schism state, the laying of the foundations, uh, Huxley or Master Ironeo that laid the foundation, uh, Peyote start diffusing, the, the, the practice exists in a way, and uh, the political situation outside is tense. Uh, and that uh, moment, there might be a schism that's happening. But because the political situation intense, there's also anticipation of something to come, something to redeem. You know, so I mentioned Walter Benjamin before. Uh, Walter Benjamin he suggested that this weak messianic power, uh, every generation have it. We look back at our history, we see those revolutions that were not fulfilled, the battles that never won, and that kind of uh, fuels us with anticipation for the next event, the next revolutionary event. Uh, so there's anticipation building up. A schism is happening, a revelatory event, a prophetic event uh, that brings uh, uh, change to the moment, uh, and that kind of brings the, the, the movement, right? So there's a modification of the ritual or the songs or the meaning or the symbols, uh, and that revolutionary spirit is charismatic. It doesn't have to be now a person. And when I say the revolutionary spirit is, is charismatic, I mean it attracts people to it. Right, so when that uh, weak messianic power is triggered, when the history is suddenly ruptured and we feel some change is happening, there is charisma to that moment. People attract to it, they wanna be part of it. Uh, this propels the movement until a new stagnation, the hype is goes down and a new stagnation, a uh, new status quo is reached. So I'm uh, kind of men gonna mention briefly now a few the other messianic uh, moments, figures in the history of psychedelia, uh, Terence McKenna and Dennis McKenna actually as well. 
uh, if you read uh, Eric Davis, uh, High Weirdness, there is a really beautiful account of their uh, messianic moment. Uh, La Churera experience, uh, Dennis McKenna had few long, long period of what might be called a psychotic uh, episode or a spiritual emergency. And uh, they developed this apocalyptic time wave theory. Uh, they disseminated uh, McKenna as a prophetic uh, voice and chanting people. You know, we learned that it kind of also been the most sampled voice in uh, Psytrance. Uh, and uh, he's enchanting people. But while, they, while he does that, they also write at the same moment the manual of how to grow mushrooms at, uh, at home, right, easily. And so while they disseminate these weird apocalyptic uh, ideas, uh, millenarian ideas, they also disseminate the, the, the way of uh, growing mushrooms at home and reignite uh, psychedelic spirit in, uh, in society after the 60s have kind of uh, lost their momentum. Um, Huxley also had that in his own way, a much more uh, ex exclusive way, but he was writing in few times, uh, for example, uh, he suggested that uh, there will be a revival, a biochemical revival of religion, and he says that this revival of religion will be at the same time a revolution. So he's anticipating the revolutionary spirit. He already writes at it quite early. And few other figures around that maybe have that true passion uh, through their own experience. It motivates them to, to act. And while they act, they also the molecules are moving in space and, and uh, between people. Amanda Fielding is giving a talk in a... In another room right now, uh, and with her passion from her, uh, kind of, I would say she has this with messianic power in the way she she acts, she connects people. She 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 connected uh, Robin Carteris with David Nutt. Uh, she ignited things in psychedelic uh, uh, culture, uh, and she operates with this passion of this can lead also to change, the societal change. Rick Dublin, as well, uh, leads uh, this thing uh, for, for a long time. He, he argues that it started for him from a vision of the Holocaust uh, in a dream, not with psychedelic. I don't know if you believe that. Uh, but, but a dream of the Holocaust that ignited him to bring healing to the world. And there's this kind of also uh, soci change in society sentiments in what he's doing. And here I would like to bring again Walter Benjamin who says, again, we look back at history, we see those events, images, history is an image, uh, we see the 60s, uh, and because the 60s are unfulfilled, uh, there is a weak messianic power that travels in society. The next generation wants to kind of fulfill uh, the second generation hippies, third generation hippies, want to fulfill maybe what the boomers have failed uh, to do, right? And, and, and Rick is kind of, brings that to people, he activates that. Uh, and people in his uh, psychedelic uh, work. Uh, but obviously, after the hype and those kind of countercultural sentiments, they're hijacked by business, uh, and, and then the charisma might be also lost, right? So the charisma, the counter-revolutionary charisma, when it's hijacked by mainstream business, uh, it, it, it might lose its own attraction, its own kind of, uh, people are less attracted to it in many ways. Other stories, uh, so indigenous people, we can see in some indigenous group this inverse missionary sentiments. They've been colonized for many years. Uh, they're missionaries, they're changing their religions. And sometimes you can see in some groups, so at least some anthropologists argue, that their uh, attempt to disseminate ayahuasca is also to heal the white person from their own uh, sickness, which destroys uh, you know, ecological destruction and uh, destruction of indigenous people. Uh, so there's an inverse missionary work. Let's turn them on on animism uh, and bring them closer to nature. Maybe that would heal society. Kushahu was a woman from Yawanawa. Uh, she grew up in a, in a tribe, uh, quite patriarchal. There are no women serving uh, in that tribe. She argued that that patriarchy in the tribe is, uh, relates to colonial influences. And she battled her way quite strongly to be served ayahuasca. Uh, that happened not that long ago, a few, few decades ago. And uh, she, in her quest, got into conflict constantly with people around her. And until her brother returned from the U.S., helped her to help convince the leaders that she can also drink ayahuasca. And from that moment, uh, she becomes an important leader in the Yawanawa tribe. Uh, she, she wants to turn other women. She wants to bring the voice. She sees uh, a female deity 
again visiting her, telling her a mission and a message that she should bring all the women to the tribe and activate the women voice in the tribe. So we see her political sentiments that also help her disseminate uh, uh, the medicine to other women. Uh, it's kind of becomes her mission to create the sisterhood and create new, new female uh, music as well. Gail Bradrock uh, suggested uh, from Extinction Rebellion, suggested she drank iboga uh, to uh, get the, uh, the code for social change. Uh, and that also maybe, it's not very clear from the story, maybe gave her instructions for uh, Extinction Rebellion. Uh, and I've, I've been speaking about it for the last few years, not really publishing about it, speaking to people around me uh, the last few years. And I started hearing more, of, more and more of those stories. Uh, sometimes they're extremely weird, you know, in the beginning of somebody's uh, 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 kind of journey within psychedelics, uh, there is maybe a small messianic moment, a weak messianic power. Uh, there are uh, revolutionary moments, even on a person le personal level, they're revolutionary and uh, they're revelatory and revolutionary in the same time. So those moments are intertwined with redemptive action. They reveal something to us and then we act in order to, to change. Uh, and this is also something that can happen in a very uh, small scale, uh, like the story of Fatima I mentioned at the beginning. It's in a small scale. It doesn't have huge impact. It's the impact of the people around her. Other Israelis and Palestinians that I, that I interviewed also shared similar revelatory to revolutionary kind of uh, processes. Um, and I would like to suggest here that, uh, you, you, uh, this is here where I end, uh, Yuval Noah Halali suggested that we, we did not domesticate wheat. It's wheat that domesticated us, right? It's like uh, we did not, we moved to homes because wheat tapped into us uh, in a certain way that we wanted more of it, right? So the, in a, from evolutionary perspective, wheat has, is winning and potatoes and rice are winning because they are uh, kind of doing something to us, right? So in the same way, we can think about we're not just hyping psychedelics, they're hyping us by managing into this like uh, rare events, rare messianic power, doesn't have to be every experience. Uh, we see that the fusion of psychedelics doesn't happen in a linear way, but non-linear bursts in time, hype moments like we experienced recently and now we're going, coming down from, right? Hype moments in time in which something is happening, maybe a book, maybe a person, how to change your mind has triggered a, a, a weak messianic power that triggered the hype uh, moment in time, but then it goes, down and by tapping into this they managed to spread their genes uh, throughout the world thank you <laughs>